Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is week eight lecture summary for BU one double three and BU one nine oh three. Uh, this week we will cover two topics here. We will first look at the production and particularly looking at um, productivity and its determinants. Then we will look at uh, unemployment. So a country's standards of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. Everything else has been equal. Uh, country A can produce more goods and services than con country B. Then definitely, not surprisingly, country A will have a higher living standard. Within the country, there are large changes in the standard of living over time. We can see it from the data. In the production, there is one important concept. Productivity refers to the amount of goods and services produced for each hour of a worker's time. And a nation's standard of living is determined by the productivity of its worker. So let's look at uh, some data. So from 1950 to 2004, uh, China has a very high average growth rate, uh, Japan, and we, we also have some countries like Argentina uh, that does not grow much. So we see that living standards as measured by real GDP per, per person vary significantly among nations. The poorest countries have average levels of income that have not been seen in Australia for many decades. And annual growth rate that seems small become large when compounded for many years. So when, you, when the growth is accumulated across 50 years, 100 years, it becomes a large amount. Okay, productivity refers to the to the amount of goods and services that a worker can produce from each hour of work. So while we see there's a large difference in living standards across countries, so we must look at the production of goods and services. And in particular, the productivity is one explanation. So to produce, we need the inputs. We call these factors of production. And these factors of production directly determine productivity. Factors of production include physical cap capital, for example, like machines, uh, like uh, uh, trucks, etc. Human capitals are uh, uh, embodied in the workers, for example, like uh, skills, uh, education, so on and so forth. Natural resources, uh, land, uh, Renewable resources and unrenewable, non-renewable resources like uh, iron ore. Technological knowledge, a new ways of producing goods in a better, in a more efficient way. Uh, economists often use a production function to describe the relationship between the quantity of inputs and the quantity of output. Uh, for example, a function could could be like this, y is equal to a, a is technology, multiply times f, f says that it's a function of L, labor, k, capital, h, human capital, and natural, natural, capital, natural resources. And this says that y depends on L, k, h, n in a very general way. And we have a times f, a here we, we we call a technology, and we give this. Uh, we actually specify the output depending depend depends on a in a particular ways. Here we actually call it, the technology is Higgs neutral. Governments can do many things to raise productivity and living standards. And before we talk about that, let me just illustrate a production function to you. For example, uh, a very commonly used 
protection function is Cobb Douglas protection function. It, is, it was proposed by Cobb and Douglas, two economists. It says that, uh, suppose this, let's suppose that we only have two uh, factors of inputs, capital and labor, and technology A. So Y is equal to A times K raised to the power of alpha, and times L raised to the power of beta. Alpha and beta, they are parameters. Uh, you, 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 you should think that these alpha are given. For example, in, in, my, in, in my example here, alpha is equal to 0 0.4, beta is equal to 0 0.6, and A is equal to 10. Uh, you, you might wonder where does alpha and beta and A come from. This can be estimated from data. But we won't cover that, of course. So now let me set the capital from 0 to 10, level from 0 to 10, and now let's use the 0 level and 0 capital to produce output. So it's uh, A, which is B3, and I'm using dollar, dollar $B3 dollar to fix the reference, multiply B5, so which is capital 0, raised to the power of alpha. So which is D3. Again, uh, I'm using dollar to fix the reference. And A6, so it's labor, raised to the power of beta, which is which is 0.6. And not surprisingly, not surprisingly, it's zero. You use zero labor, zero capital to produce you produce nothing. And similarly, you can find the output, say, if you use 10, uni 10 units of labor, 10 units of capital, you can produce 100 units output. So now, you can draw it to visualize this production function. Let's draw this. Surface. So you can see this, this is the, the the vertical axis is the output, the horizontal, and this axis is the repre represents capital and labor. You can you, you, you can see that this is uh, like uh, heels. If you uh, use more capital, and more labor, then you can produce uh, more goods and the services. However, the increase the more labor and capital you use an extra unit of labor, extra unit of capital, the increase in output will be smaller. So this is called law of diminishing returns. Let's look at, let's say suppose the uh, uh, capital is fixed at one unit. So let's draw the output as a function of labor. So you can, you can see it more clearly. Uh, the more labor you use, um, the more output you are going to produce. However, if you look at the slope of these functions, it, the slope becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. So which says that the more workers you use, the extra output that the next workers will contribute becomes smaller and smaller. This is called law of diminishing returns. And one implication of this law of diminishing returns is that Let's say we have two, 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 two countries. One is a, a rich country, the other is poor countries. Rich country has high capital stock, a poor country has low capital stock. So if we spend one dollar in country A, which is rich, country B, which is um, uh, poor, so now this one dollar capital will have a higher contribution, marginal contribution, in country B, because country B's capital stock is is low and the marginal product of capital is high. In, in contrast, this one dollar in country A, the marginal, the actual contribution of this one dollar in, in country A will be small because country A is already very rich, already has a very high capital levels. All right, okay, so let's a uh, production function. 
So uh, in terms, of, in order to raise the productivities, uh, government can uh, use different policies. For example, like uh, encourage saving and investment, encourage investment from abroad, encourage education and training, increase uh, the human capital, establish secure property property rights, and then maintain politic political stability. So that like, encourage R and D, promote free trade, promote uh, research and development, etc. Okay, so that's production. Uh, let's turn to uh, unemployment. So um, generally, when we talk, when we talk, when we talk about unemployment, um, we are concerned with three basic questions. First one is how does the government measure the, the economy's rate of unemployment? How do we measure it? And what problems arise in interpreting the, the unemployment data? So if uh, say the unemployment rate is 4.5%, what does that mean? Third question is how long are the unemployed typically without work? So the duration of, of unemployment. Okay, um, ABS Australian Bureau of Statistics is responsible for measuring the unemployment. What ABS does is to survey 0.5% of Australian households which are chosen randomly. And this survey is known as labor force survey. Then estimates of unemployment are derived from this survey. Only adults aged 15 years and older are included. So basically, they are going to, they will uh, call you, ask you questions. Do you have um, at least one hour paid work in the previous week? And if you answer yes, then you are employed. If you answer no, then ask. Then they might ask you, um, are you waiting for a job to start or are you looking for a job? You, if you say no, then you are out of labor force. Otherwise, you are counted as unemployed. So a person is considered employed if he or she has spent at least one hour of the previous work working at a paid job or family business. And if a person is on temporary layoff, is looking for a job, or is waiting for the start of a new job, then this, guy, this person is considered unemployed. A person who fits neither of these categories, such as a full-time student, homemaker, or retiree, is not in the labor force. So through these surveys, all adults, the adult population is uh, classified into three categories. First category is the employed. Second category is unemployed. And third category is those who are not in labor force. For example, uh, like this chart. And from this, we can calculate the unemployment rate, is, which is the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. So number of unemployed divided by labor force and times 100 to make it a percentage. A second uh, important statistic is the labor force participation rate, which is the percentage of the idle population that is in labor force. So labor force divided by whole idle population. And here's the uh, data. For example, like uh, in 2007, uh, the total unemployment rate is 4.1%. Labor force participation rate is almost 65%. And you can separate into male and female, so parents with dependents, persons not born in Australia. And particularly, uh, the ABS uh, calculate the unemployment rate for teenagers aged between 15 and 19. And not surprisingly, we see that unemployment rate is much higher 
than the total levels. In addition, teenagers tend to have lower labor force participation rate. Okay, here's the a trend of unemployment rate uh, and the labor force participation rate. We see that the men, women increasingly participate in the labor force. All right, um, so when we are looking at the unemployment rate data, so what should we be aware of? Um, the first thing is that, say, suppose the economy is very bad, in a very, very bad times. Actually, we can see the unemployment rate decrease. This is because uh, some discouraged workers, they keep not being able to find a job. So in the end, in the end they just say, okay, I'm going to give up. I'm going to just give up looking for a job then these people they are counted as not in the labor force okay so this if people uh, if these discouraged people uh, give up looking for jobs then in the end that we find that uh labor force particip participation rate decreases and unemployment rate can decrease as well in addition other people might claim to be unemployed in order to receive financial assistance, even though they aren't truly looking for work. Okay, uh, so the question is, how long are the unemployed without work? Argument one, most spells of unemployment are short. Argument two, most unemployment observed at any given time is long term. People look, look at the data and find that most of the economists' unemployment problem is attributable to relatively few workers who are jobless for a long period of time. So why, why should this happen? In an ideal labor market, wages should adjust to balance the supply and demand for labor, ensuring that all workers are always fully employed. So, so if the labor market is ideal, then we don't see any uh, unemployment. People who want to find a job, they can find a job. However, we can have frictional unemployment. It refers to the unemployment that results from the time that it takes to match workers with jobs. It takes time for workers to search for the jobs that best should that best should their taste and skills. Even though everything is it, it, it is working well. Uh, when when the workers want to find a job, it still takes time. We could have structural unemployment. It is the unemployment that results because the number of jobs available in some labor markets is insufficient to provide a job for everyone who wants one. So why should we have structural unemployment? Unemployment. This could be due to minimum wage laws, unions. Efficiency, efficiency wages. For example, let's say this is a labor market. We have wage on the vertical axis, quantity, quantity on, the vert, on the horizontal axis. So that's labor supply. This is labor demand. So if the labor market is ideal, supply will, e will be equal to demand, wage rate will be WE, uh, equilibrium quantity is LE, so there's no there's no uh, unemployment here. Okay, suppose there's a minimum wage. Government, the government says that the wage cannot be lower than this red line. So at least, given that given this wage minimum wage level, uh, firms are willing to hire LD workers. Workers are willing to supply LS workers. So now. There are this many people, surplus of labor, who want to find a job but couldn't find a job. And these people are counted as uh, unemployed. Okay, efficiency wages. Efficiency wages are above equilibrium wages paid by firms in order to increase worker, worker productivity. The theory of efficiency wages states that firms operate more efficiently if wages are above the equilibrium level. So firms, if I'm the firms, I want to pay the higher wages. I'm hoping two things to happen. 
first one you you will work harder you you will exert more efforts secondly people will, will know that uh, I'm offering higher wages so I'm going to attract more capable workers so these two reasons justify the firms to offer a uh, higher than the equivalent wages so for worker effort and for worker quality okay um, so to find a job people need to search the process by which workers find appropriate jobs given their tests and skills is a job search um, so this this type of this type of unemployment is different from the other types of un unemployment so it is not caused by wage rate higher than equilibrium it's not caused by time spent searching for the right job it's it's inevitable because the economy is always changing even if uh, economists in the long run equilibrium we can still have unemployment changes in the composition of demand among industries and origins are called sector sectoral shift and it takes time for workers to search for and find jobs in new sectors all right um in in this process public policies can help uh, government can do something here for example government programs can affect time it takes to unemployed workers to find a new job including employment agencies these agencies can provide information that facilitate the job search public training programs increase the work that the unemployed workers human capital unemployment benefit that give um, uh, a certain a support to the unemployed workers okay the unemployment benefit program is a government program that partially protects workers income when they become unemployed so it offers part partial protections um, for limit for limited time so it on the one hand, such benefits increase the amount of such employment. On the other hand, it reduces the such efforts of the unemployed. It might also improve the chance of workers being matched with the right job. All right, that's all for uh, week eight.